welcome. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone and welcome to How Repair Events Can Help Fix Our Throwaway Culture, which is the fifth central program of Climate Preparedness Week, an initiative of communities responding to extreme weather and co-sponsored by the Massachusetts Library System. My name is Gabrielle Griffiths. I am the Assistant Youth Services Librarian for Brewster Ladies Library, Repair Event Organizer, and Blue Marble Librarian. The Blue Marble Librarians are a group of librarians working together on initiatives such as Climate Preparedness Week to help libraries and their communities become sustainable. I am thrilled to be hosting tonight's program with our speakers John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight, authors of Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture, which comes out this October from New World Library Publishing House. If you would like to read this book, you can request that your local librarian purchases it support your local bookstore, or find it through the link in the chat, which I put below. I am so excited um, about this book, as it brings attention to how the global grassroots repair movement is empowering individuals and their communities to come together and to take action in a very broken world. It acknowledges that the climate crisis and the social and environmental injustices of this crisis can only be fixed if throwaway culture is transformed into a regenerative one that views people, places, and things as not being disposable, and that we have an obligation to mend what is broken, whether it is a toaster, a relationship, or an ecosystem. Before we begin, we thought it would be fitting to give you some context of how this program came to be, which we also think really speaks to the power of this grassroots movement. In my former position as outreach coordinator for Wellfleet Public Library, I coordinated an annual fix-it clinic with the Wellfleet Recycling Committee. A wonderful group of people, by the way. <laughs> One spring, I received an email from Ray Fowle, a repair event organizer in the Bolton, Massachusetts area, saying that there were two people writing a book about repair events and that they were looking for people to respond to their survey. So I responded. <laughs> and that is how I came to know and quite frankly adore these two really special people, John and Elizabeth. Later on, they also asked me to write a very small section of the book about quick tips for trouble, troubleshooting electronic devices. And so, as coordinator for Climate Preparedness Week, or as a coordinator, I thought that this book fit perfectly with this year's theme, which is social resilience is climate resilience. The idea being that when communities come together and work together, they are naturally better able to tackle problems related to climate change, such as extreme weather. We hope that in this program, you will see the abundance of positive outcomes of repair events and that you are inspired to get them started in your community. That being said, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers. I am severely truncating their bios um, for the sake of Zoom. And then we will go over the who, what, when, where, how, and why of repair events with a Q&A at the end. And again, we invite you to um, put your questions into the chat as we go along tonight, and we'll try to get to them all at the end, or at least as many as possible. All right, so Elizabeth Knight started Orange County for New York's first repair cafe, which for four years has been serving people from as many as nine different towns and two states. She and her team have received certificates of appreciation from county, town, and village officials. In celebration of Earth Day, Elizabeth founded an annual Too Good to Toss community swap, which is visited by hundreds of people who come to shop for free. And John Wackman founded the first repair cafe in New York State and describes his role as that of coordinator, communicator, and cheerleader of for repair cafes in the Hudson Valley, Catskills, and Capital District of New York. He has presented on community repair at the New York and New Jersey Library Associations. He serves on the board of Sustainable Hudson Valley and is a commissioner for the City of Kingston Climate Smart Commission. And so, please join me in applauding our speakers. And um, before we begin, John just had... Um, something that he wanted to, to mention before we launch well, into questions. Well, this is simply to follow up. Uh, we have enjoyed seeing you all uh, as, as you, you know, came online. Uh, name the town where you were sitting in, into the chat. So it's great to see that. And we have seen people from, uh, from the UK and Canada as well as uh, all around the country. It's just fun to see. So 
if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and do it. Enter it into the chat. Uh, we certainly uh, have, want to encourage use of the chat throughout this. And as Gabrielle said, we'll, we'll save the questions, but send them through. Yes. And also, if you've ever brought something to a repair cafe or repair event, please feel free to also put that in the chat because we're very curious. Um, so that being said, my first question to both of you tonight is, how did you two meet and how did this book come to be? Well, I met John through a um, sustainable Hudson Valley project. We had corresponded before, and he came to our town to do an actual presentation in, in my, my small uh, town. And then, John, I'll let you tell about how, how oh dear, I, Jasper's come in again. Uh, <laughs> so John can tell you how it was that we came to work on the book together. Well, you know, it's important to say both Elizabeth and I have been very active in, in climate resilient activities in our respective towns. And, and this goes, you know, this is something that goes back years for both of us. So we were kindred souls in that regard and found ourselves working on the same sorts of programs in our, you know, as I say, in our, in our two hometowns. And uh, I was, my skill set is woodworking. And so when I go to a repair cafe, um, uh, I will bring my tools and I will sit down and and try and fix things made of wood. I was doing that at the Beacon Repair Cafe on the Hudson River, the city of Beacon, and had you know I was working along and a woman sat down in front of me and she says, "I've been here for a little bit. I think this is wonderful." They say, "You're the guy I should talk to. I think there's a book in this." Yes, she was a literary agent uh, living right there in that town. And, and so we got talking seriously about this. And, you know, I tended to agree that there was, there was just a lot to say about it. And then uh, once I was into it and was well into writing the proposal, Elizabeth, for quite some time, had been sending these wonderful reports on the repair cafes that she organizes in Warwick. So this would, these reports would run two to three pages long, and they were just so, you know, uh, descriptive of the people who came and the things they brought and, and basically what happened. She was, she was setting the scene and, uh, you know, giving us a really good idea of what's involved. And I thought, oh, my goodness, that's what this book needs. No one, no one better to write it than you, Elizabeth. And so I invited you to uh, be a co my co-author. It was, a, it was um, one of the best things I ever did. Thank you. And it was, this has been one of the most interesting books I've ever worked on. And I wrote the report simply because that's what I used to do when I was in a, in a corporate life after there would be an event that I'd managed or when I was working for a marketing communications firm and I had to come back and tell the art team what had happened, the rest of it. And I thought it was really important for all of the people who volunteer. My volunteers come from nine different towns and we get people from, from like 13 to 19 different towns. And I thought, if you're working on the woodworking table, you don't see what happens at the sewing table or the bike repair or the digital repair. And I found out from sending out the reports, which was a matter of, I wanted them to know how much I respected and appreciated their, their giving of their time and their talent and their skills. And I wanted to tell them what, what the whole big picture was. And then the fascinating thing about it was they would answer the report and say, oh, well, you didn't see what happened when Ray was <laughs> working with the bike pump. And no, it wasn't um, a backpack. It was a um, baseball glove. And so then there would be the interaction between each other. And one of them said to me, do you know how satisfying it is just to know what else we didn't see? And someone told me a long time ago when I was in the home furnishings business that the best selling shape for a dinner table is round because it's in our DNA to gather in a circle around a fire and listen to stories. And that's what a repair cafe is. It's the heart fire of the community. And the relationships. You bet. And the relationship, exactly. And I love that so much about this book because it, you really bring together and distill so much wisdom and, you know, everything that people need to know about starting a repair event, but it also includes, you know, the cultural and economic history of how we came to this moment of this throwaway culture. And, 
you know, the solutions and philosophically why it's so important um, in light of the 21st century and how much technology we have. And um, we were talking earlier about just the magic of repair events because once you go to one, mm. you start looking at the world differently mm -hmm. after because you start seeing all the fixers in your life. So that leads us to, for people who may not be familiar with repair events, we, we just wanted to cover some of the basics, which sure. is, you know, what are repair events and, you know, how did they start? So, you know, whoever wants to answer those first two yeah, I questions. think John, he started the first one in the state. I defer to John. The, the phrase that we have used from the start is uh, Repair Cafe is a free community meeting place to bring a beloved but broken item to be repaired for free by an expert who is also your neighbor. So this phrase, beloved but broken, has turned out to be, you know, very powerful. I really, I, I just see people's, you know, they respond to that. It has, uh, it connects. And uh, so, yes, what we want to do is be able to, in a sense, normalize repair because repair had become something that was out of the norm. And what we want to do is bring it back into the mainstream. Um, we, it is, just as Gabrielle said, it is a change of mindset. And that is that is really our ultimate goal. Uh, yes, we want to fix things. We want to extend the useful life of things that you own. Uh, we want to satisfy your curiosity about the way things work, uh, and uh, we want to uh, share the skills and honor the people who have these skills. So the uh, the idea of intergenerational and hands-on learning is at the core of repair cafes. And I'd also um, point out, as John says, many times it's uh, someone who's a neighbor or someone you've seen at the grocery store, but often at every repair cafe, somebody will come through the door and say, you know, this is just so great, so cool. How do I get one in my town followed by, or um, I've got time on my hands. I know how to sew. Do you need somebody who can do that? Do you need another person? You've got a long line there. So it's also a way of, yes, sometimes the people are your neighbors, and sometimes they're the people whose names you don't yet know who are going to be your new friends. And you see that people sitting side by side who've perhaps never seen each other, and it's like, what is that? Is that a lamp with the, the orange flamenco dancer and the shade is her head? <laughs> now, we have to say that librarians have been real champions of the Repair Cafe, uh, certainly in the Hudson Valley. And, and it does speak to this um, point of, you know, repair is an activity that it, it just makes good programming. As mm -hmm. I say, it, it's intergenerational. It is hands-on learning. It, mm -hmm. it may bring, bring people through your door who haven't been there before. And so, you know, the, the learning of aspect of it is very important. One of the phrases we use is learn to repair, repair to learn. Mm. I love that. And another term that you both taught me that I didn't know um, is the term of visible mending. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, John, we had talked about asking our participants tonight, how many people have heard this term visible mending before? Okay, so we'd, like to, we'd like to throw this out to our participants. Uh, if you would please enter into the chat, is visible mending a term that you are familiar with? And Gabrielle, it's you who, in our, when we were talking last week, you said, well, isn't that what repair is all about? It is making repair, it is making mending visible. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, and we do it in, the, in, a, you know, in a very public community way. Community, repairing in community is powerful. It is, and I, 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 love, I love that term, and thank you so much for talking about libraries and, you know, the Massachusetts Library System, thank you so much for, for hosting this program tonight, um, because we do really want to encourage and invite librarians to host repair cafes. And Elizabeth had pointed out to me something that I had never heard about before, which is pop-up um, repair clinics or fix-it clinics, um, that if you couldn't host a whole one, you could 
you know, have like a little one here and there. Um, the category, you know, we're going to do a repair event that is just bicycles. Right. And my library, when I was looking for a place to host our repair cafes, the head of the librarian, and by the way, it's um, the Albert Wisner Public Library, and it was voted the best small town library in America by Library Journal Magazine in 2016. <laughs> Yay! Um, we looked at the space, and the space that they had to offer we felt was going to be too physically small for the volume of people coming through. And she said, you know, Elizabeth, the library doesn't have to own all of it, but we would like to be able to offer another version. So what we did was sort of three, we picked three categories to do a more intensive teaching opportunity. Sewing, one of them was a bicycle repair and another one was a knife and small tool sharpening. So they were intensives that we didn't have the time to do in a regular repair cafe because of the volume of the people coming through we needed to serve. Yeah, so they there were basically are DIY workshops, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hand, but it was hands-on. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that kind of leads... People have said, I'm sorry, I've, I've seen the chats come through, and some are and some are not uh, familiar with the term visible mending. It, it, is, it is mending made visible. In other words, it's mending made to be seen. Uh, so you are sharing what you've done. It is primarily in the textile arts. So these are patches that are done with, you know, thread that is not the same color as the fabric that jumps out at you. Uh, and it, it is a, you know, an expression of personality and creativity. And I, I can show you one if you like, a sample. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Well, that was my first attempt, and it was, it's, the craftsmanship level is zero, but the idea was to fix the patch on my, the knee of my jeans. And as John said, the whole point is to be creative about it doesn't need to match. It's what is it that you're trying to do to bring attention to that? That's part of the story. I can remember as a kid, my mother always um, sewed our, our clothes and I had a cinnamon brown jumper. I wore to school the first day and I tore it. And the best thing was, without knowing the term visible mending, she made a patch in the shape of a lily pad and then embroidered a little felt frog with bead eyes to sit on the lily pad. It was great. So it's the same kind of flexibility. Yeah, so we can, you know, talk a little bit about who are these people who do this repair. And they certainly come from all walks of life. You know, many of our repair coaches, and we use that term intentionally because we want to emphasize the back and forth. When someone brings an item to a repair cafe, well, yeah, they check in at the West welcome table. They basically register their item and then they get matched with, you know, someone who's really going to be able to attend to that item. And they sit down and then it's a, it's a, the conversation begins. It's like, what is it not doing that it's supposed to be doing? When did it stop doing what it's supposed to be doing? What sound does it make? And it's all of this. So the conversation gets going and what you, what you're embarking on is troubleshooting. And troubleshooting to many people is an irresistible proposition. It's problem solving. It's ingenious. And my goodness, it's so creative. So you, you have this dialogue. You're sitting across the table with a guy or a gal. Now, the, the categories are very broad. So we, I would say the largest work area is mechanical, electrical, and electronic. And the item that we see more often than any other hands down is lamps, rewiring lamps. So a whole lot of that, but everything else that is, you know, countertop appliances um, through, you know, through to in, um, things that you use in your shop or garage. And then textiles and jewelry repair is really important, very popular. And um, things made of wood, as I say, that's my skill set. So we see you know, wobbly chairs, uh, tables that need their legs repaired, um, drawers out of skew so that they don't pull in out properly. And then there's the whole area of electronics. That's certainly very important. So, you know, I would say a core of our repair coaches are either professionals or uh, retirees because they have a lifetime of skills and knowledge. I asked um, 
with somebody who wanted to volunteer uh, to be a repair coach. And I said to him, well, uh, what kinds of, what's your background and what kinds of things do you like to work with? And he said, honey, he said, I've owned my own home for over 50 years. He said, anything that goes wrong, he said, I'm the guy you have to fix. And he became one of the, the pair of men who would do the bike repairs. And the other man that he works with had owned his own bicycle store in Manhattan for 49 years. But you also get, well, what kinds of people? homemakers, homesteaders, attorneys, um, uh, an Airbnb host, a beekeeper. It, it, you don't have to be brought up. You don't have to have an engineering degree, although, as John says, many of them, many of the coaches do have engineering degrees and are retired. A lot of teachers, the, they love the idea of passing on knowledge. But it's more the matter of if you've ta- if, whether you're self-taught or you were trained to do it, a lot of these people, John was talking about um, the thrill of troubleshooting. Most of them, if you, if especially the guys, if you ask them, well, how, did, how old were you when this started? Oh, I used to sit on, oh, one of them, Michelle in Green Austin, she said she used to sit under the family dining room table with a screwdriver and work on the chairs. And it's, they, they often say, well, and I couldn't put it back together, but it's the thrill of being able to figure out for themselves, how does it work? What will happen if I do this? Gabrielle, isn't that part of your childhood as well? Yes, it, it very much is. And one of the things that I loved in the survey that you both sent out for your book um, and that you include so many other people and so many perspectives of how they came to fixing and what fixing means in their life. Mm. And I know that I shared with you that um, my father is, uh, he repairs and restores old instruments. He's a luthier um, just as a hobby. And my, my grandfather was a like, you know, all hands handyman. And my great, great grandfather um, was a shoe cobbler. So it's like, there are so many different um, tinkers and um, people that do things just, you know, on the side, it's not even their main profession. My, my grandfather was a plumber. But, you know, to, to that, like, who are the people who do repair events that you're right, it's, it's, everybody. <laughs> I feel like everybody has a fixing skill and um, it's just figuring out what role you have and where you play in. And I don't know if we mentioned this yet, but um, Elizabeth and John, you talk about um, even just being able to brew a cup of tea um, is uh, it's a skill too. It's a skill we, too. We need it because, you know, there is the cafe side. And it's very important. It's the social setting that we that we create. You know, whether it's in a library or a church basement or a community center um, or a town hall. You know, there's that's bringing people together. And, and you know, we just think it's very important to bring people from all parts of the community. You know, it, we find that you can have people sitting down. They they come for a common reason, and that is because they have broken stuff. And, um, and yet when they sit down, it may, you know, bridge a, div- a divide, a partisan divide or any other divide that they feel in another setting doesn't, doesn't come into play at a repair cafe. And it's also a lot easier to talk to people when you're, as John says, you're there for this, a common reason. There's something that's not working. And you see people who have never seen each other before suddenly get into very deep emotional stories about this is why I brought the lamp. This is who it belonged to. This is why I brought my granddaughter because it was my mother's and now it's going to sit on her nightstand and we can't make it work. Yeah. It's, and they, they used, I used to be in the tea business and the expression then was since the uh, oh, hundreds of years, tea is always considered a social lubricant. When you're sitting down having a cup of tea together or one of our volunteers has a, her daughter loves to bake. She's in the eighth grade. And when the dad comes to bring the things to fix, this child often walks through the door with something that's right out of the oven. And there's like a little bunch of lemmings going to the table to see what she brought this time. Mm-hmm. So it's, everybody's got something to share. As one of the, the um, women who answered the survey said that everybody, whether they're self-taught or not, has something to share that the rest of us need. 
you know, and we hear all the time that, you know, oh, there used to be places to bring things to be repaired, and all those places have disappeared. Where did they go? And don't we wish we had them back? Well, that's one of the goals of the repair movement is to reestablish the repair economy. You know, a, a, uh, a real ambition of ours is to return repair to the point where it is a, it is a good livelihood for people. Our, our events are free, but our events are not meant to address all repairs. They never could. Uh, we need people to regain those skills and bring them to their communities. One of the people who answered the survey, Heidi Spinella in Massachusetts, said, repairing goes hand in hand with living lightly on the planet and having respect for all animate and inanimate objects. And then she said, whether the glue holds or not, Sometimes just listening to each other is the best repair we can make. I love that quote. And as we're talking, it's reminding me of, um, so for Climate Preparedness Week, the keynote speaker was Eric Kleinenberg, the author of Palaces for the People. And for anyone who may not be familiar with this book, um, I highly recommend it. It's a great companion piece for Repair Revolution. And you both actually mention this book in your book, <laughs> um, which I felt was so appropriate. And the term that um, Eric Kleinenberg reinvigor reinvigorated is social infrastructure. And so as we've been talking about, you know, what is social infrastructure? And so social infrastructure, it refers to this term, which is the places where people go um, to, to meet one, one another. So for example, you have three different spaces, your first space, which is your home, your second space, which is your work, but the third space is a place like a library, a park, a church, a community center, these places that you go to develop and to socialize. And what Kleinenberg talks about, and it's a very pro-library book, which we appreciate and love, um, what he talks about is how there's been a decline in the investment in this social infrastructure and that the historical success of the country was really built upon these places and these places where people could go and meet and face each other. And I feel like, you know, repair events, which happen in libraries and community centers and schools, it's people are bringing broken items and they're meeting people that they would have never otherwise have met before. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, and that's where the subtitle of Kleinenberg's book, which is about, um, you know, how it can help stop the, polarization of society and the decline in civic life. And I think repair events, they accomplish that so much mm -hmm. in such a beautiful way. Um, and I guess that kind of segues into the outcomes of repair events. And, you know, they're so multifaceted. If you want, you know, either of you want to speak to some of the outcomes that you have seen from, you know, Six toasters to all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things so we, I think we realize is that, you know, no number of repaired toasters mm -hmm. and laptops are, are going to, you know, draw down the carbon in our oceans and our atmosphere. So what are we really talking about? It is the signal that we send to people who come to a repair cafe that we are better off when we are see ourselves in our own community working together and where positive outcomes are realized. And, and this is all just, you know, it is, as you say that, Gabrielle, it is strengthening that, that social infrastructure. You know, there is nothing proprietary about getting a group of people together in a town to fix stuff. And so it doesn't have to be a repair cafe, it doesn't have to be a fix-it clinic, could be a repair hub, a repair lab, a fix-it Friday, you name it. But getting people together to do that is, it really is, um, it's a, a way of changing people's relationship with their stuff. And it's a change of mindset, my goodness, you know, we, we really, of course, uh, hope that everyone who is participating in, in this online event, you know, will be interested enough to look around and, you know, and talk to other people about getting this going in your town. We simply believe there ought to be a repair program of some sort in every town. And when I was trying to start a repair cafe in my town, 
I had several people say to me, you know, you don't understand this. You haven't lived here very long. This is a pretty well-to-do community. People will, can just afford to go buy another one. And when I needed to start the repair cafe and I only had three coaches lined up about 10 days before the first event, and I'm thinking, should I just pull the plug on this? And then I thought, well, what are they going to do, fire me? So I called the mayor and said, you know how you do these signings where you have um, giant scissors and a ribbon across the, the building that's going to open or the new store, would you come do an event like that? One of the, and he said, sure, call the Chamber of Commerce, they'll set up the photo shoot. One of the women from the Chamber of Commerce said to me, well, aren't you concerned that you're going to put people out of business? And I said, like whom? And she said, well, you know, what kinds of stuff do they bring? And I said, lamps and small scale furniture, the list that John had just given you. And I said, first of all, there is no place around here to repair a lamp. And second of all, if it's a lamp that means something to you, it was a wedding gift, and you want to give it to your granddaughter now that she's getting married, you, there aren't two of those to go buy. And that turns out to be exactly true. It's Yeah. But let me touch on or open up another door here, and that is a repair in the classroom. Uh, we... Uh, we all, we who run repair events, all make contact with our local high schools because high school students very often need um, um, community you know, service. Yeah, community service credits, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. So here they come and they show up, and you know, uh, the joke is that you know, kids will teach you what you don't know about your own iPhone, you know, ask, ask a 12 year old, right? And, and so, yeah, these kids, they gravitate towards, uh, I would say either the digital table or the textiles table because visible mending is something that they're really picking up on. And so, you know, here you've got, you know, both young boys or young and young girls uh, sitting down uh, at a sewing machine, mostly for the first time. <laughs> so this is something that is, really important and uh, Martina Pospa who founded the Repair Cafe in Amsterdam will say that uh, until repair becomes a normal part of the classroom that we will not have the ability that we need to as a whole society you know to change our relationship with our stuff and you know and here we are throw a turn around this throwaway economy. And John can tell you, um, because he has one too, one of the most popular tables at re many repair cafes is the kids take it apart table. We have often had people bring in things you had asked, well, what are the outcomes? We, on average, f can repair, given the time and the tools and the resources we have on hand that day. Most repair cafes in the Hudson Valley are doing, what, 80% more repair Mm -hmm. of items who come through mm -hmm. so most people bring in two and most of it is fixed but if there's something one woman brought in a uh, hair dryer and it was she said it smells bad and it smokes when you turn it on the coach said to her i think this one's had it and she said um well then should i just throw it out and we said no take it to the kids take it apart table it's manned by uh an adult and the adult walks you through, here's how you take, we've got little tiny screwdrivers and little tiny wrenches, and they sit and actually learn how to take it apart. And as they're doing it, he explains, this is why this does this. And John can tell you about it. Uh, Holly uh, mans the repair, and she's a teacher, mans the repair oh, cafe you. table, kids table at yours. I've had one woman said, um, my son can't sit still. And she said, he hasn't moved in a half an hour. She said, he's only four years old. I came downstairs one morning and found out he'd taken apart the vacuum cleaner by himself. She said, but he likes to do it with other people. He wants, this is what he thinks is play. And that's how most of us start to learn is by playing and then yeah. being fascinated with it. And we've from talking and hearing from the reports from many of the people who started, they were the kinds of kids who took stuff apart under the kitchen table. But that's a great way to start an attitude about learning. It's a common narrative of most of our repair coaches that when they were kids, they liked to take things apart, couldn't put them back together, but that started them on their learning curve. Yeah. 
Yes, I absolutely love that. And it's fascinating because I also, we've, we talked a lot about inclusivity and how, you know, repair events really highlight people with all different skill sets. And I personally, I find them to be so fascinating because it just, it's, so, it's eye opening all of the different constituents and the parts and this works to, together and getting to talk to people who this is how their mind works um, mm -hmm. and where I have different skill sets. It's just, it's just such a pleasure to be able to, to do that um, and to learn from well, people. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, we, we think that, you know, one section of the book that will be surprising to many people is the affinity for repair by autistic adults. And so what we have found is uh, people with autism coming to our repair events, first to kind of check it out, but then, you know, to actually do the repairing themselves. And, you know, this is a, a social setting that they might otherwise not be uh, necessarily be comfortable in. Um, but if they can sit down at a table and focus on an item that needs to be repaired, this is really something that is, you know, fits fits their interests, fits their skills, and, and just is a, an opportunity to be out in a social setting and yet uh, accomplishing something that is really gratifying. And so this affinity between repair and autism is something that I bet most people have no idea of, but it's a very powerful association in our uh, you know, in our world. And I actually, Panda Marie, I see you're there, and I know you're joining us from London, right? Uh, and he's written, he's written uh, several uh, blog posts about this very subject, and has also been uh, interviewed on the Restart Project's uh, Restart Radio, which is, a, you know, a very worthwhile um, interview series from the Restart Project in, in the UK. And Gabrielle, it isn't just um, people with autism who are particularly good at doing uh, mechanical repairs. One of our repair coaches uh, is a musician, and he worked on uh, stringed and fretted instruments. He brought one of his uh, guitar students one day, who also uh, is on the spectrum, and they performed a concert during the repair cafe on the stringed instruments, some of which had been repaired by others at another event. But that was another way to participate. And there is a woman who answered the questionnaire who runs a repair event in the, on the West Coast. I, th I think it was Washington State. She has a son who's on the spectrum, and she said he helps by sitting and paying attention when the repairs are done, even though he doesn't do the repairs himself. So the point is, everybody's got something to bring to this. It's like um, thinking of a patchwork quilt. Everybody's got their piece to bring. And when it stitches together, you've got something beautiful that warms a whole community. One of the women who was trying to get a repair cafe started in Connecticut um, wanted to get the word out to the community. So she had a small booth at a, an annual fair, for lack of a better word. And the booth wasn't electrified and it wasn't big enough to actually do repairs. So she had people sit down and sew a button on a banner that in the end spelled the words repair cafe. And she said the kids were fascinated, little kids, four, four years old, were well, fascinated to learn how to thread a needle. And, and that story's in the book, too. But um, it's, it's one of the things that we will often, um, you know, we'll, when we're letting people know about what we're up to, we'll say, hey, your grandmother knew how to do this, do you? <laughs> yes. And I'm so glad that you shared that story because I think that does really bring us um, in many ways, full circle to when we, you know, the title of your book, which is throw away culture. Mm. And that word culture is really important because what is culture? Culture is what we teach and what our children pass down and they teach to their children. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point in which what has been taught is not to necessarily repair, but to throw things away. <laughs> um, and so I think that especially working in a library, 
this is a really perfect event because to me, when I look at the world that we're living in or the world that I live in, it seems to me that we have different types of infrastructure and different types of systems. And we have systems that are built for profit and we have systems that are not built for profit. And to me, the wisdom of the repair is that we, it's a system and it's a way of thinking that is not based around profit and that kind of mindset, but rather around community and around mm -hmm. stewardship and around yeah. humans and ecological stewardship. And so... Circularity. Exactly. And so to me... Um, you know, one of the final questions that I had before we, you know, eventually move into our question and answer um, moment is, um, you know, why is it so important to change our culture? And really, this, the, to me, I feel like the only way that we're going to fix the climate crisis is if we transform our culture and we move away. And your book has a really it goes through so many things, but you look at, you know, the historical aspect of things, the economic history, the cultural history of how this really wasteful single use culture came to be. And you have some graphics that, you know, show what does a linear degenerative economy look like, right? Versus what does a circular regenerative economy look like? So I guess to just to pose that to both of you, which is, you know, to you, you know, why you were motivated, again, I know we, we went over this in the, in the beginning, but like why you were so motivated to write this book, what you hope the out outcomes of the book are, um, and really why it is so important <laughs> to change our culture. So anything you want to address in that department. The, uh, this whole idea of one of the things that I think you will find if, if you are out talking to your own kids and their, and their friends is that how many kids really don't understand that things can be repaired. Uh, what they know of the world is that when something breaks, you get a new one. And mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is so fundamental. And, and so how are, we, how, how are we able to turn that battleship around? There's a, a teacher in Saratoga Springs, New York, um, Michael Whitney. Mm -hmm. and, he started something called Mr. Whitney's Tinker Club. And um, what the, he, he got a, a group of 10th graders together, and basically they fanned out across the school looking for stuff to fix. And they also put out the word to all of the classes, bring stuff from home to fix. And what they did is in the space of about a week and a half, they fixed 100 items, which then they presented to the whole school you know, in an assembly. And out of that, came a weekly club. And so this is a group of kids that get together every Friday afternoon and fix stuff. And that has been pretty transformative. That is not a public school, I, I will say. Uh, and, and it is very you know, challenging for public schools and public school teachers to find a way to work that into their school week. But it is something that we certainly believe uh, needs to happen. And I think that's part of why repair cafes have an affinity with makers clubs. Um, I've held events with, uh, we have a local group that's uh, makers and artists, and we've done a repair cafe in a same space where those, the results of the, um, like a, a Christmas crafts fair, we did one right after Thanksgiving, and all of the items were either recycled, upcycled, repurposed, and then we had a mini pop-up repair cafe in the middle of all of that. Yeah. So that makes the connection also. Yeah, so there's, you know, repair cafes are, are, are skewing younger and younger because um, uh, millennials, 20-somethings, 30-somethings are seeing the value of this. Uh, Lord knows, you know, this is where you get into tool libraries. If you're familiar with that phenomenon, that is really a, a really big part of this. We see that as, you know, totally you know, um, in, integrated with uh, repair events. And uh, so these kinds of things are, are, you know, I think working a broad cultural change. And speaking of cultural change, it also happens on a personal level. I was telling Gabrielle when, when we were talking the other day, um, 
the notion of having kids do, who needed to do community service, not just for schools, but often with churches if they're going to need to um, have communion, for instance, for a local Catholic church. Uh, a boy came in because he needed the community service hours, and you could hear him when his dad came to drop him off. Um, the truck windows were down, and the father was telling the kid all the things he didn't want to hear about him and what a problem he was. And this was, I mean, he was just reading the kid the riot act, and all of us unloading our cars to set up the repair cafe could hear it. And when the kid got out of the car, one of the women who was a retired high school teacher said to him, well, I think the rest of the day is going to be a lot better than this. So the kid was um, paired with two adult coaches, one for lamps, one for bicycles and other re wheeled repairs. And he enjoyed the lamps. But when he really perked up and bolted from behind the table was when a woman brought in a lawnmower. And he dashed over and the adult coach came with him and the coach told me later he said it was astonishing he said the kid is quote a mechanical genius he asked her a couple of questions and diagnosed the problem correctly and under a minute so when the dad came to pick the kid up i knew what time he was coming i said to the two men the boy had worked with um what did you think and they said well when can he come back he was great and i said i'd like you to tell his dad that when his dad picks him up tell the dad specific things about what he did and why you would like to have him back. And you could see this kid just talk about visible mending, stood up, held his head up, looked at his dad. And the next time we had a repair cafe, he brought another classmate with him. And the two boys worked alone with an adult looking over their shoulder the entire time, not a, not a single problem with them. And they diagnosed again, another um, somebody else's lawnmower, the guy who brought it in and put in the wrong kind of gas. So it's visible mending and it's connection with kids. And they, like a lot of the coaches, some of them say, you know, I spend all day working on in my head stuff on a computer system. I just want to get my hands in something. Well, the kids do too. Yeah, I, I love that story. And it's true because you can really, um, vis visible mending and, and the confidence that you can instill in people. So That's we're coming. The word. Yes. Confidence. So we, confidence yes very much so and a confidence that carries through the rest of your life and I think yes. that's so important for young people because when they're young their egos and they're just developing their identities are fragile um, you know some more than others and I feel like that is such an important thing for uh, you know for adults to understand is how these situations really do make or break children in ways that you know they may not even be aware of and if, to be able to give confidence is such a huge a huge thing. We are coming to the end of our time, so we just wanted to um, take any questions. I do have a few here, so for anyone who wanted to um, have your questions answered, please feel free to send them. I'm going to read some of them off uh, for everyone. Um, so one of the questions that we have here, let me see. Um, one of the questions says, have you thought of working with public schools that have shop classes or the equivalent, bringing the students in as apprentices, perhaps? And the answer, I can answer that, uh, which is yes. Um, working in youth services, I actually live right next to the tech school. And, um, you know, before COVID, this was one of my, my big goals was I really wanted to start a repair cafe here, a repair event here. So um, personally, I can say yes. Um, John and Elizabeth, did you... I think you, you, John, said that you always reach out to the high schools. Yeah, and shop classes seldom within the walls of the high school, and now, as you say, it's moved to a BOCES or a tech school. And uh, so it, it's a bit different from the way it used to be, but it is still pretty, uh, it, it's actually growing in vitality and relevance. Yes. So another question that we got, which we talked about earlier on in the program, was whether libraries... Um, are thinking of having home repair clinics for public programming and just to answer um, that yes that I um, that is how I met John and Elizabeth which was through organizing I was a repair event organizer and I got a survey that had um, that they had sent out so just wanted to answer that for anybody who might have come late um, other questions John, um, you have one or two about so what are we doing during the pandemic yeah. So um, I was just uh, going to say that I know that there are some people who have been 
uh, hosting online ones, virtual ones, which is really exciting over Zoom, and they have a whole format. And I believe mm -hmm. the Restarters community, I want to say, that's where I've learned about the, the virtual repair events. Mm -hmm. There is a website. It is repaircafe.tv. Uh, I'll say that again. It's repaircafe.tv, and that is a central uh, listing for virtual repair events, which are primarily taken, uh, you know, uh, done through Zoom, and they've gotten better and better. So uh, it's interesting to check those out because those are truly international. You have, you know, skilled people joining the Zoom gallery from all over the world, and and then different items are. I get looked at in more detail in breakout rooms. It's working pretty well. Uh, the other thing is some, some locations are doing pop-up mini repair cafes outdoors with social distancing. John and I went to see one over the weekend. Um, we're, my, my group is not comfortable with meeting uh, in public that way. But what we're doing is I'm getting – phone calls or emails from people somebody said the tab is off on my sweatshirt um my knife is broken um my lamp's not working so i asked them to send me a photograph and a written description if they can of what's wrong and then i circulated out to my coaches and on an ad hoc basis somebody's lamp larry said i'll go pick up some of the supplies from fix it bob and i'll go see the person in greenwood lake so <laughs> that's in fix it bob <laughs> yep that that's what they call themselves. Yep. So that's been, it, it's, um, I usually get, I don't know, one, one phone call or email a week, and we just, we've just finally started to organize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another question that we had um, is, it seems like many products are less durable now and therefore less repairable. Ikea furniture, for example. <laughs> Um, and sometimes products are even designed for planned obsolescence tech. Do you have any ideas about how we can address this as part of the repair revolution? Yes, and this is what we're referring to now as the re right to repair movement, which is incredibly important to what we're doing and, and everything that we're talking about. It's a, uh, it's a substantial chapter in the book. Um, basically, it is true. Plans obsolescence is a uh, absolutely true thing and, and has been very common since the 30s at least. Uh, products are not built to last. And, and now we have a situation where many companies are um, uh, basically designing things and putting up barriers for repair. So this whole idea of repairability, that things should be, must be designed to be repaired. Uh, the 80% of the environmental impact of the things that we own is determined at the design stage. And, you know, we have not gotten stupider about designing products. Uh, we should be able to build a uh, refrigerator that lasts 50 years the way we used to but uh, the fact that we don't is not a you know uh, it, it is intentional it is it is not an oversight so uh, yes right to repair uh, this is something that if you do a brief search in in your state Massachusetts is, has been a leader in the right to repair movement, and many and here you are all many of you in Massachusetts. Uh, you wrote the book on auto repair and made sure that third party auto repair shops could stay in business and get the tools and the information they need to do those repairs. That was subsequently moved into all you know uh, products of across the board and uh, and in all 50 states. But the right to repair movement, uh, I encourage you to do a quick search in your state, see where that is in your legislature. Uh, there are right to repair bills before the legislatures of about 25, 26 states. And this will be very significant. Yes, and so we're, we're running to the end of our time. There are so many wonderful questions. Um, I'm going to take one or two more before I answer. I just wanted to answer one of the, we're getting a lot of questions about how to recruit people. And what I wanted to say, 
is um, the book Repair Revolution really contains all of this information. Like all, I'm seeing all these questions, um, which is amazing and so exciting to me. And so what I love about your book is that in the appendix, you have um, all sorts of different subsections, things about, you know, stuff for kids to take apart, sample letter for recruiting new repair coaches, you have sample flyers, repair tool inventions, website recommendations. You also have guides on different types of repairs. But I would say that this book really does contain everything you need to know about starting a repair cafe, minus the pandemic. <laughs> um, I think that one threw us a curveball. Um, one of the uh, last questions that I wanted to take because we are at um, the hour marker is just that um, the question is, in terms of consumer perception, what do you think are the key changes that are needed to make them choose to repair? Um, you may mention basic awareness that repair is possible. That is so true. Anything else? I think the notion that <laughs> we're all responsible for the decisions that we make when we make a purchase. And as someone famously said, if, if you can't fix it, you don't own it. Think about before you purchase something, are you going to be able to repair it? And that could make the decision. And before you purchase, think, do I really need to replace something? Is this simply a matter of, I don't know how to fix it or where to go. And those resources are available now more than they used to be. Uh -huh. But it's, a, it's about making a decision that I'm, it's not always about the money. It's not about the consumer choice. It's also about one of the words that John uh, uses a lot is agency. To feel that you can do this yourself and we're here to help you. Or somebody is. Somebody you know knows how to fix things. Yeah, and wants to like share to, it. I'd like to end with one brief quote. All over the world, People are pooling their resources, sharing information, and learning how to be more than just consumers. Yeah. They are learning to be fixers, and they are starting to fix their world. There you go. I love that. Um, yes. With that being said, um, we are re reaching the end of our time, and so I have just sent along um, my contact information. If anybody would like to get in touch with me after this program, um, and if the, you want to continue the conversation, um, it's something that I feel just so grateful for, for everyone who is here today. Um, and we also just really wanted to thank everyone who made this event possible, all of the fixers, all of the organizers, all of the coaches, um, all of the tea brewers, really everyone, because it's true, we need each other. And right now we need each other more than ever. So I just wanted to, to thank you all for being here and to thank you, John and Elizabeth, for writing this book, um, because I do feel that it is a book that can change the world. And I hope that through you know reading this, it's going to inspire uh, just the cultural shift that we are hoping for and that we need. Starting a repair cafe or a fix-it clinic is not that hard. You can do it. You can do it. All you right. can do it. And you'll, you know what, I would like to end by saying when John and I first met and I was getting this off the ground, he said, you think you're going to be keeping things out of the landfill, and you will, but what you don't know is you're building community. And I thought, well, what does that mean? I'm telling you, I saw it the first time. Yeah. People walk through the door with this broken thing and they walk out. One of the, one of the customers said, quote, customer said to me, you need to be standing outside the door and look at the expression on people's faces. And she's out in the parking lot. They're standing by each other's cars and saying, what did you bring? Did they fix it? What does that thing do? That's building community. It's quite a lot of fun. It really is. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it is. It's so much fun. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. And um, yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for you. the opportunity. Good My night. My pleasure. Good night.